I remember Adelstrop, the name, because one afternoon of heat, the express train drew up there unwontedly. It was late June. The steam hissed. Someone cleared his throat. No one left and no one came on the bare platform. What I saw was Adelstrop, only the name, and willows, willow herb and grass, and meadow sweet and haycocks dry. No whit less still and lonely fair than the high cloudlets in the sky. And for that minute a blackbird sang close by, and round him, mistier, farther and farther, all the birds of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. Adelstrop by Edward Thomas, which in fact was one of the stops on, on, the, on the train journey. He was evacuated as a child because he, he was at school during the war to, to the Cotswolds. Um, this was one of the stops on the train station, but uh, on the train journey, but it doesn't exist anymore. It's a beautiful village. You're a lovely girl. I was telling my wife all about you. Oh, really? George, I'm sorry, I thought your wife had died. 1978. Still talk to her, though. Tell her my day. Don't you do that? I do, yes. And death shall have no dominion. We know that, you and me, hey. I think only re really when he was taken out of the house did I really take on board that he was dead and he was his physicality was going away and not coming back um, but we had a great tradition in really my father's family I think it's an Irish thing um, that the deceased person comes back to the house on the day of the funeral so I knew that he would come back then but um, and of course I went to see him. I went to see him as soon as I was allowed to at, at the Chapel of Rest. I went to see him every day, which may sound a bit weird. And I, I talked to him about the arrangements that were being made for, for the funeral and, and what we were going to do about that. So as soon as I was able to, I would would just drop in each day and just have a little chat and explain what was happening, um, which was very helpful for me, really. She tells him how brave he was, and she then begins a process of registering the moment where his body is actually finally uh, put to rest. And she does that not just through the bathing, not just through having some choice about when the coffin leaves the house, but also to all those visits where she can go, she can talk to him, she can inform him, ask him about the funeral, and in her insistence, very, very, very important, that Oswald comes back to their much-loved home for the day of his funeral. And that is partly a call to her Irish roots. She talks about how culturally that's very, very important but also it's a chance for him to come back into her life, in his body, before she says goodbye again. So we say goodbye to the dead many, many times, and we keep them alive in our speech, and that's very, very important. I, I talked to him, I mean, it sounds silly, I mean, he couldn't, he was dead, he couldn't hear me, but I just wanted to say to him, I did say to him, what a wonderful 15 and a half years we'd had together and how incredibly courageous he had been when he wasn't well and how very sorry I was that he'd had such a very difficult time during the previous four days really, well, previous few weeks but especially the previous four days. And I remember one morning he, he had to wear support stockings because his legs swelled and he was busy putting these on and would, wouldn't want me to help but you know I went to see if I could help. It was quite an effort putting these things on and he so I, he was sitting on the edge of the bed um, with his stockings and I just knelt it on the floor and said you know could I help and he just took my face in his hands and he said oh I think I might be going to cry I'm so sorry he said, you've been such a wonderful girl and you've got such a dear face. And I said, oh, you're the handsome one, it's not me. In a way, with that, 
sadness and releasing tears, we know it's very good for us, it's good for us biologically, it's good for us emotionally. And in a way, not crying is a stranger thing to do. If we find someone who's lost a partner that they've been with, say, for you know, around 15 years, like Margaret and Oswald, and they're not crying a couple of years on, well, then we might wonder, actually, are they foreclosing a very significant loss? Once the weather clears and spring starts and the bulbs come up in the garden, I have to tell him which things are flowering. And of course, it begins with the snowdrops. So I always have to tell him that the snowdrops are out. And when I came back from my holiday in France a few days ago, uh, of course, there is this wonderful display of flowers at this end of the garden at the moment. And um, he loved the mock orange and the scent in the evening. And on these few warm evenings that we've had, I've sat in the garden in the dark uh, with a glass of wine and said, I'm sure you'd like to know I'm sitting in the garden and the scent of the mock orange is just so overwhelming. It's beautiful. It's anger, isn't it? It's rage, it's rage. I get so angry with other people. People in love or out of love or wasting love. And women with children, growing children, fertile. <laughs> but most of all, I'm so angry with him. I'm so angry with him. A lot of people feel angry when somebody is dying and has died and they look round to blame whoever they can possibly blame, whether it's the doctors or even the person themselves for dying, which is awful really, but this, uh, they, they can't help it, it's part of the whole process. But I knew that Oswald had had the best possible medical care and everything possible that could have been done for him had been done for him on an, a number of occasions. and. He was surrounded by people who, who loved him to bits, really. There was a lot of support always. And he battled very long and hard to keep as well as he could for as long as he could and to do as much as possible. So it, even though we had to curtail things, obviously, to some degree, um, Nobody could possibly be angry at somebody who put in such a lot of effort to keep going and be as well as possible. So anger was one thing that never, ever featured um, in any aspect, although I have seen it professionally lots of times. The crucial thing is to talk about it. And talking about it will involve weeping, it will involve nearly pretty much the whole gamut of emotions you know, from someone being furious that their partner's dead to get a terminal illness that means they're going to leave them, to kind of guilt all the what would have beens. And in a way, each couple, each individual, and all of us, whether we know we're going to die or not, need to find some ways to bring it into our life. Because as Margaret shows us, if death has been talked about and thought about, then it can be easier to find ways, to create ways of symbolising it, so that after the loss, we can have some kind of mutual references to refer to. There, there were times when I felt like crying, um, but that has got less. I think that was more in the first couple of years, and it has got less. For example, on a, on a lovely day when we would sit in the garden and, 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 and read, and he's not there to share that. That's, that's still quite sad. Um, I suppose because I knew for such a long time that he wasn't going to live, I, I, I'm, because he didn't know that, I kept all of that very kind of internal in, in a way. But there, there were occasions. And for example, th there was a beautiful rose over the front door. It was just a deep, deep red and had a lovely fragrance. And I had major work done on the house the, the year after he died and, and sadly what with the building works and the drain that had to be replaced that rose gradually died and I was profoundly upset when because he had planted that and it was very beautiful but principally because he had planted that I was very upset and I cried when I saw that that was dying it took three years to, to finally die um, 
but I did take some cuttings and they're beginning to grow again, so I've been able to tell him about that. He had recorded that uh, shortly after he left RADA. They had auditioned people and he'd won the audition and he'd, his voice was making this important safety announcement for the underground. And Embankment Station was the last station where the old recording Mind the Gap still uh, was playing until last year when suddenly, for some reason, they found it necessary to have a new PA system and there was a new voice. And this was a station that I used frequently because I go to the South Bank to concerts and to the theatre and I walk across the bridge and get on the, the tube at, at Embankment and I often used to wait for the next train so that I could listen to his voice again. Mind the gap. And suddenly, one day last November, it wasn't his voice. And I said to my friend, what's happened to, to Oswald's voice? It's a different announcement. Maybe the tape has broken. And I felt slightly panicky and a bit anxious, thinking, well, what if it's broken and they can't fix it? And I was there a few days later doing the same journey, and it was this new voice again. And I was then really quite anxious, panicky, and a bit angry, and afterwards a bit tearful, because I spoke to the guard on the station platform, and she told me that they had a new PA system with a new voice, and yes, they didn't like it either, and they couldn't hear it. And I said, well, it's not that I don't like it, but I explained the reason for my interest. And then I decided to do something about it and managed to find uh, a way of sending a message via the TFL website. And I'm not very good or very confident with comp computers. So I rang and spoke to a person, which is much more my sort of way of communicating. And I explained the reason why I had an interest in, in the announcement and asked if they could restore it. And I explained my reasons that my husband was no longer alive. Um, I like to sit and listen to his voice. And they said, well, maybe we might be able to restore it and um, maybe we could send you a recording. We could perhaps make a CD. Anyway, they, they did manage to do that. I didn't hear anything for two weeks and then customer relations contacted me, a very nice lady, by phone and by email and said, we have managed to do a CD and we are trying to get the voice back on. And I did feel a bit sad and tearful. It was, it was actually a very emotional moment hearing the voice for the first time again. Uh, but it was wonderful. Mind the gap. I, I sort of kind of get the feeling that one doesn't mess with Margaret and that, you know, um, uh, if Margaret wants something done, then it gets done. Um, and I think in a way that's why it's had such incredible kind of popular appeal, because we all want, when we die, someone to fight for us, to fight to kind of keep us alive. And I think the reason everyone fell in love with the story was because of this, you know, incredible woman going, actually, no, not yet, Oswald's voice still. And that appeals to us because we all want to try and get rid of death a little bit. And so I, I just love the fact that he's back there and I can continue to listen. It does bring him very close to me. And I, I would have been devastated. I would have had to get used to it, not being Oswald. Um, but I would have been very sad if they hadn't managed to, to bring him back. What we find really is that there can be an assumption in training that people must be able to cope with talking about death. And yet it's such an existential concern and anxiety for anyone. We need to make sure that all medical staff have enough time to think what it is like to talk about that process, what their own beliefs are about death, what happens after death, uh, what a good death might look like so that then there can be reflective space so that they don't force that onto whoever they're speaking to. 
Otherwise, for example, we might have a doctor who has ideas, maybe a family history, that death isn't something that's spoken about, that death is something that's kind of put under the carpet, and they can then transfer that to each and every patient they're talking to about death. And we need to make sure that doesn't happen because these communications are some of the key ones in a life.